Late last week, uh, Miles hopped in the flow room and asked people for talks because he had nothing. So I mulled it over for a weekend and forgot about it, and then we kind of asked again. So late last night, like a term paper, I began on this. Um, so I discussed with them the topic. I didn't want to do a Ruby topic. I wanted to do something different. Um, I had Postgres on the brain. I've been doing some uh, semi-ish semi deep diving at work. So I wanted to do a talk on Postgres. So what could I talk about in a relatively short amount of time with not preparing much? So started with uh, Parlet tricks in PSQL. Um, but I only know four, so that won't really last very long. So I went with how about um, good Postgres advice. Um, I'm not a DBA, I'll probably give you all bad advice, so that's out. Um, I went clickbaity, thought maybe this would uh, work out. Uh, no, so I just called it what it is, and um, it's totally not thrown together. Postgres talk number 84. 84 was a random number that Ruby picked out for me, so there you go. I'm Tony, I'm a senior, the senior web developer at Moby Wireless Management. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, three things. Um, first is four things you can do with the actual PSQL binary. That is the client library used to directly talk to Postgres, uh, similar to just the MySQL client. Um, some do's and don'ts I have discovered over the past eight years of using Postgres in a live environment, and that should have been crossed out. Um, there's only one neat query feature at Postgres I want to show you guys that very few people use. Oh, there it is. Yes, only one. So starting with um, psql, the slash e command. Um, so you're typing a lot, you're typing a big long query in your terminal, you hit enter and you have a dreaded syntax error. So here's my big S query. And my big query. And let's say, oh no, I have a syntax error somewhere. And it happens to be in the middle of everything at the very top. And I can sit up and Change it in. Oh, now I have to scroll through everything, and it even scroll. It, the vertical scroll even breaks that, so that's a bad idea. So what can I do then? Well, you type slash e, and magically we are now dropped in the your editor with the previous query that has ran on the server. So you can edit it all you want. Let's remove my obvious. Oops. Dd. Thank you. My obvious uh, syntax error. All queries end in a semicolon. Right quit, and it runs. So this is a good way to actually kind of make a, sketch, a scratch pad of whatever big long query you're working with. Um, be advised um, if you have com uh, comments in there which begin with uh, dash dash, and you run it, and you go to slash e again, those comments will be gone because the Postgres uh, the query does not interpret it so it doesn't have concept of that as the last thing that ran. Um, you can change what editor you're in by modifying the uh, editor environment variable. So if you're a dirty, dirty um, Emacs user, you can switch to Emacs. Um, or you can even use Sublime if you're in a graphical environment by setting the uh, uh, path of editor. Wait, can you go back to the, uh, what was that code? Or the numbers. The numbers? What numbers? Uh, oh, this? Yeah, what does that mean? Oh, uh, well, that's that's the actual uh, that was column in names in the big ass query that I have. So this oh. is a result of a Rails query that um, I'm including two models. So Rails will use. T0, R0, T0, R1 for table 0, row, uh, it's more like field 1, field 2, to keep all of the uh, data separate when it builds the active record objects. And just ignore the uh, recursive union there. That, that's nothing. Don't worry about that. <laughs> so that's G parlor trick number 1. G parlor trick number 2 is slash timing. So normally in MySQL, um, when you run a query in the client, it'll tell you how long it took. Postgres does not do that by default. To turn it on, you use slash timing, um, which I'll just do that. 
Now, you can set a piece dot piece equal rc file to execute slash timing each time. Timing is now on. To turn it off, you just call the same thing again. If you're going to query, and I wasn't stupid and use a big long query that wraps everything. God damn it. <laughs> How about this? How about this? Time. Oh, there it is. Yes. Total time in milliseconds. This includes sending it to the server, query planner running, query planner executes, sending back to the client. So it's the entire round trip. Next problem trick is I really enjoy this slash watch. So let's say you're on production and uh, you know queries are running uh, something slow. We don't know what's running, but we need to monitor uh, something basically. You can ask Postgres, for example, to show me all the current running queries. Uh, but you execute that once, and you just get the list of all the current queries at that time. You have to hit up, enter, up, enter, up, enter every time you want to run the same query. If you append slash uh, watch at the end of whatever query you want, notice the lack of semicolon. Postgres will run that same query before the slash watch once every, whenever it feels like it, typically three to five seconds, I believe. So that's a good way to have a query that basically spits out stats or information that you need, and, to, and you just need to constantly refresh it for whatever reason. So I can do, yeah. Uh, can do. Select now actually gives me the whole, yep. So if I do select now, watch. There you go. Just executing the same query over and over and over again. Oops, and control C to get out of it. This parallel trick is slash copy. So we all like working with CSVs. Uh, commonly, if you're working in a Rails app, you have a background job worker that iterates over active record objects, spits them out to the CSV class, ties it up to paperclip carrier wire, wire and sends it on its way. Um, that's great, um, except what if something is, what if you have an extremely convoluted and complex report you need to build that is better served using um, pure SQL instead to do a lot of the calculations, you're not dealing with a bunch of Ruby objects. If you can construct the, if you construct one entire query that gets you all the data you need for your report, you can then pass, you can use slash copy, give it a query, give it a path to write a file, and say you want it with, as a CSV with optional headers, which is the headers of the uh, query of the uh, query result. Postgres does it in one big go and writes it to that and writes it to wherever you say what to tell it to. The path is relative is relative to the server you are running on. So if you have an app server and you have a uh, actual database server executing on the app server using a client, will write the file on the on the um, app server and not the database server. Um, a similar function to do this is copy to, which you do act which you do as a, within a query itself. However, you need super user privileges. So um, slash copy is commonly what a lot of people do if they, if you're in a uh, confined or non super user environment. Uh, both take similar, mostly the same arguments. The documentation for this lists them all out. It's pretty clear. If you're some kind, you make semicolons instead of commas, but it defaults to commas. Uh, determine what you want to do with nulls. If you want empty spaces, you want the word null, you want puppy dogs instead, you can specify that. And so that's pretty much all the parlor tricks I have using the PSQL client. I personally love working with raw SQL compared to uh, basically we're using an ORM when possible just because I have full control over what I want to get. But um, as a guy who's worked on worked with Postgres and a report and reporting on various bits of data at my day job uh, for about a total of six seven years where I'm currently at, um, I've learned a lot of things with Postgres. Well, we started with MySQL and Mongo, and we eventually moved all the way to uh, full on to Postgres. So we've been happy with it, but we have learned some stuff from it. Um, this is not a scientific results, so your mileage will vary. Um, this is just based on what I know, what I've noticed with Postgres. Um, if you really want to get in the nitty gritty, hire a DBA because they know exactly what they're doing. Um, but this is 
what I do is enough to get us go to uh, keep us going pretty much. So the first do is index concurrently. So when you index a column in Postgres, the entire table locks until the index is complete. Um, this means no reads and no writes on the table until that's done. If you have a table of 10,000 records that's actively queried on every web request and you deploy an index in the middle of the day, you're going to have a bad time. Because the index must wait for all transactions to complete, must lock the table, all requests must queue up until the um, uh, index is complete. Once it's complete, the lock is released, and then you just get a fire hose of queued up requests and queries that may have already timed out on the website for all we know. So a way around that is Postgres implements concurrent indexes. This basically does uh, what current indexes do, except it takes twice as commonly twice as long, but it does not lock the table for reads. It locks the table for writes, however. But on a heavy read table, this is actually kind of handy. Basically what it does behind the scenes is Postgres will put a write block on the table and start um, Going through the row, uh, going through the column of each row, and starts building a partial index, and basically sets a, I don't say timestamp, but a checkpoint of the state of the table and the last row inserted. And actually, I lied. You can actually do writes while doing a concurrent index because that's the whole point of it. It sets a checkpoint at the last known row created or updated. It goes through the entire table. Not locking, the re not locking any rows, writing the partial index, and then it will go back and say, all right, what has changed on the table since I first made my first pass? Lock those individual rows, complete the index, or update the index, and then finishes. So that's why it takes commonly twice as long if it's a pretty active table. However, you can safely, it's safe essentially to do this in the middle of the day if you're so inclined. Um, however, uh, you do take some overhead, so things may slightly slow down because building an index can be CPU and disk intensive. And a small gotcha <coughs> uh, that we found out is if you have a long running transaction, for whatever reason, even if it's for a completely separate table, uh, concurrent indexes like to be uh, Mr. Nice Guy and say, oh, okay, um, you finish your transaction and then I'll apply the, uh, I'll start applying the index. Um, Nothing locks, but your migrations in, during deploy just kind of sit there until you realize I should probably kill this job to let this go through and start it up again. So um, try to avoid long running indexes, uh, long running transactions when possible, just as a general rule. Uh, to do this in Rails land in your migration, you have to explicitly tell Rails to not run the tr uh, migration in a transaction. By <coughs> default, every migration, individual migration, is a transaction. If you run a transaction inside the concurrent index, you might as well just be running a regular index at that point, because it will lock. The, the transaction will override the concurrency. So you turn that off, and then when you your add index uh, DSL, you say you want the concurrent algorithm, and it will essentially just do it for you. However, don't over-index your tables. Indexes are essentially small, mini, binary tables, just like anything else in Postgres. It's just optimize for quick lookups to point directly to the physical rows in the table. However, they do still have to take up space. Indexes take up space, they provide overhead, every insert becomes slightly slower the more indexes you add to the table. So while they're great for reads, they're hor they can be horrible for writes, and they can be horrible for um, disk space, disk usage, and just storage for backups as well. So sometimes Postgres doesn't even care about indexes depending on the table. So pro tip, there is a, I'm not sure what the threshold is, but there is a threshold where if your table is small enough, the query planner will say it's quick enough just to do a full sequence scan and check every single row, then to dig into the index and try to find matching records. Yes? On that note, yes. um, I, find, I, I found that it's not actually the table size, mm -hmm. it's about uh, the number of rows uh, it, it, from your query. So if, you're selecting, say, 10% of the rows in your index table, it's going to do a sequence or scan there anyway. Because it'll just be quicker just to go through 10% of the rows. 10% yeah. okay. uh, may not be right, but it's somewhere around there. Gotcha. Um, there is a handy way um, to ask Postgres, hey, give me all the indexes and how many times have you used it? Postgres has great built-in um, stats for just about anything that goes on with the database. You can query it against one of its meta tables. So using my site app as an example. 
Uh, the leg is. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a quick query, and of course it wraps. Well, oh, th thank you, team ups. Or, um, my turn. How's that? Yeah, that's slightly better. You have a, a identifier column. Don't worry about the schema. Uh, rel name is the uh, table, and index rel name is the name of your index. And really what you care about is the IDX scan column, where zeros mean this index has never been used as far as it's aware, as long as the index <coughs> has been made. This is a local copy of my uh, site app, so um, I don't really touch much of the database. I just make sure it runs and then run tests for that. But this is a decent way to say, oh, I have my primary keys you want to keep, but we have user category. Well, OK, can I give nothing that? OK. Unique user category entity on user category views has been used a total of zero times. Why has it been used a total of zero times? Probably, probably won't run this on production, but all right, what queries are you running that would use the columns that this index uses? Why is, why is the query not running it? Uh, why is the query player not using it? Um, commonly, if you have a index that is multi that has multiple columns in it, um, you want to format your where clause to commonly use the first row, the first column in that index for Postgres to actually use it. There are some use cases where if your where clause only contains the column that is like in the middle or the third or the near the end of the list of um, columns, Postgres could use it. But as a rule of thumb, if it's a multi-column index, the first column needs to be re used in the where clause or in the select clause for some calculation for Postgres to even care about using it. So keep that in mind with multi-column indexes versus single uh, single column indexes as well. Do, however, apply indexes to foreign keys when you know that you're actually going to use them. So uh, a user belongs to a group User ha users has group ID on it, which is a foreign key to group. Unless you're going to come from group and say, I want all the people that belong to this uh, belong to this group, or um, just give me, you know, select star from uh, star from users from these group IDs. There's technically no good reason to have an index on that column. It sounds counterintuitive, but <clears throat> like I said, you don't want to over-index because end up wasting space, especially if your table index is uh, pretty uh, huge. Um, so it's usually a uh, basically a game time decision uh, when you first make the table, first make the column, if you actually if you want to index it as well. Um, then again, you can always concur and index it later if you realize, oh, we actually need the damn thing later on in the app. Um, as a com as a common use case, you want to index anything that's a foreign key. It's not worst idea in the world, but if your tables start to get pretty huge, you want to really start considering what actually needs an index. Am I actually going to use this in inquiries or not? Because if you go from a user to a group, you're not using the group ID column at all. Well, you're using it, Rails is using it to look up in the group table, but it's not using the index. The Postgres is not using that index. Also, pro tip. Um, by def so the default um, algorithm for indexes in Postgres is B-tree, which is great. It's fast. However, if you use if you apply to a string column and you use like or I like, that index will never get used. B-tree is not built for that at all. Um, it can technically be used if you have a wildcard at the far right of the uh, query. So using examples like whatever or foo like bar with the wildcard. It can sort of issues the index. It's faster than doing the full sequence scan, but it's still not quite optimal. If you really want to use it, there is a, um, if you really need to use like um, in an optimal way, the PGTRGM uh, extension provides um, specialized functions for the gin and gist index types where you can use uh, likes and I likes. Uh, does anyone, everyone know the difference between like and I like in Postgres? Anyone know? Good? Okay. I'm going to uh, say no. Okay. So, <laughs> <is that laughs> I was like shouting no in my mind. 
you're coming from MySQL lane, MySQL by default will do a case insensitive equality on strings. Postgres is the opposite. It will do case insensitive, in case insensitive by default. Um, so if you use, so if you're using like and you put in Bob with all capital letters, but in the database it's Bob in all lowercase letters, Postgres won't find that by default. If you use I like, it's a case insensitive search at that point. It's slower though because it's case insensitive. But pro tip: use indexes if you are sorting stuff. So let's say we have a blogs table with a publish column on it, and we sort by it a lot. <laughs> Putting an index on it, Postgres will not only use it for the where clause, but also use it for the initial sort. Whenever you specify an order on Postgres, it has to essentially sort the entire result set the best it can first, and then start doing its scans and index scans to start yanking out the proper columns. So it gets the stuff in the right order as it goes. If you have an index on the same column that you are ordering by and um, filtering by, it will apply the filter and the first sort at the same time. So you, initial, so you get the initial sort and filter, and then it starts filtering by anything else you need clause, which can be pretty handy. Um, if you, by default, your uh, indexes are essentially ascending. Um, there is such a thing as a backwards index scan in Postgres. It functions, however, if you want full speed ahead, you can specify a direction, descending or uh, ascending for the column that you're indexing on, which is kind of handy. Um, and, uh, try to avoid subqueries whenever possible. Um, this is better than having Rails execute a pluck for a set of IDs and shoving that into a separate in clause for another query to run. Because at least this way, Postgres just runs essentially one thing at a time, or you, at worst, you have one round trip to server and back instead of two from Rails land. Um, the problem is, um, depending on the table structure, the indexes, um, it can be a bit slow, pretty slow. So for example, you have 10,000 widgets and 20,000 users belonging to that group. Um, it can get a bit hairy because it has to go through all the users first and then apply to the owner ID, filter that, and then get all the widgets back, plus anything else you have one query to do. It is commonly faster, especially if you have indexes to join columns, to do a join instead, because uh, uh, typically the query optimizer will just handle it that way. There, I have seen a couple cases where the query optimizer will treat that as a join and use, uh, essentially almost rewrite the query for you. Uh, however, depending on whatever else is going on in your query, it may just fall back to, all right, I'm going to do one query behind the scenes and shove it in there, which can be slow. Do create specialized indexes if you're doing something funky with your lookups. So let's say in this example, uh, we have set of employee, employee records who all belong in a cost center. Um, for whatever reason, they can be, they come in from a system in mixed case, and we want to allow the users to specify any case they want for a cost center lookup. So commonly what you would do is um, call, tell Postgres, all right, lowercase all the cost centers, and we're going to have Ruby down case all of my input, shove that in there and run. Well, if I have a regular index on cost center, um, lowering it will eventually bypass the entire uh, index altogether. What you can do is then tell Postgres, okay, make me a specialized index on employees. Go ahead, lowercase all the cost centers and store that in the index. They'll use that index for when you use lower in your query, and it'll be much faster. Um, this may seem so kind of intuitive because it's originally it was an awesome feature. Um, Postgres originally had an extension called, well, it still does, called each store, which if you imagine it in Ruby land, it is a single, or rather it is a one level deep hash in which strings and keys are, excuse me, in which keys and values are both strings. And you can actually store that in Postgres. It's sort of a, sort of an unstructure-ish data, uh, data structure that you can use. Um, 
In the beginning, it was great. Uh, we, uh, we used it at Mobi a lot. Um, however, later on, um, Postgres, I mean, um, JSON came out with Postgres 9.2, I think. And in 9.4, they added JSON B, which is much faster. Um, the benefit, well, the benefit of both HDR and JSON is you're both, both queryable. So imagine having Mongo in your relational database, and it's queryable, and it's indexable, and you can perform various operations on it. Um, the benefit of using JSON is that, um, similar to regular JSON, it stores data types. So you can actually have integers in your column. You can have strings in your column. You can have arrays in your column and act on them. Uh, and you don't need an extension like you would with HDOR. It's actually now baked into Postgres proper now. The couple gotchas, um, JSON and JSONB tend to do take more space physically on the disk, um, especially because it's unstructured data. Postgres doesn't really have a optimal-ish way to store it like it has with a string or an integer. Um, and if you are using pure regular JSON and not JSONB, there is no equality operator on it, um, which basically breaks down to you cannot say select distinct star if one of the columns in the table is a JSON column. JSONB is OK. Um, just something to keep in mind. Please, please, please use explain, analyze. So you have a query, it's running in production, it's hella slow, new relic screaming bloody murder, or your customers are screaming bloody murder. What is wrong with this query? I don't know, it looks fine to me. Well, you can have Postgres tell you exactly what it's doing, what indexes it's hitting, what indexes it's not hitting, so you can make decisions about it. There are two vari uh, variations to this, explain and explain analyze. Explain will send the query to Postgres, and Postgres will return the rough estimate of what it's going to do and maybe how long it's going to take to do it. If you say explain analyze and then your query, it's going to determine the plan, execute the query on uh, the server, so you know, fair warning if this is a fraud box and you know this query takes five minutes to run, but it will actually send back the exact plan it's uh, used and the full timings, the amount of time it took to plan the query, the amount of time it took to execute the query, and the amount of time and mixed in with the amount of time it took to send the query back, as well as I think a few other timings. Um, so to give you an example of what this looks like, uh, uh, let's use this query, so it's not a little huge. Explain, analyze this thing, go. And you get this helpful blob of who knows what back. <laughs> this is Postgres's way of telling you exactly what it's doing to deter to run the query. Um, it's a little counterintuitive how to read this. Um, you commonly want to read it out, inside out, as far as where um, a lot of the work is going. Um, so you can see at the very beginning. We are doing a sequence scan, which is typically a red flag. If you see sequence scans all over the place for a very large query, you know you got problems. It's not using any indexes. It has to, it's physically scanning row by row, yanking records out of the table. Um, you can see it's doing sequence scan for this specific filter in the query. We are doing sequence scan on all the announcements. Um, we even have some subplans going on here. So yeah, uh, I have no idea how to read this. All I know is index scans are good and secret scans are bad. There is a site explain the, I, this thing. And loads on another monitor, thanks. What you can do is paste in your query, the uh, explain result into here. Uh, you may want to anonymize it, but it will convert well, let's just do it. Uh, and then copy. Chrome, please. Thank you. Yeah, let's anonymize it. Don't throw it on the history page. And it will tell you in a more graphical way, red is bad. Less red is good, basically the pain points of the query, which is 
kind of handy. There's a couple other sites out there. Um, little like convert to JSON if you want if you want to as well. Um, and there's doc there's documentation on exactly what how to read these, but it is a good way to better visualize um, what the hell is wrong with this query. So I'm keep in mind for that. Like I said, red is bad. Um, this is where most well red is where most of the time is being spent in query, I should say. To actually yeah, get the results back. Clear as mud on that? Okay. Um, sounds also counterintuitive. Don't over normalize your data um, in certain situations. Here's a use case that so we have clients, users, widgets, and users have many widgets. And <coughs> widgets have many users. We have many, many, essentially many, many relationship in the middle here. Uh, here's the uh, Rails model la uh, layout. layout um, to ask the question, how, uh, what widgets are actually being used by clients, users? Uh, we have a has many widgets through users, so it has to jump through users to users' widgets to get that data. That's great. So this is the query that will essentially run to get the distinct widget IDs that we actually are actually being used, because a user could, two users could use the same widget, and you would get duplicate results back. That's the query it'll essentially run. A distinct from user widgets would do a uh, inner join on uh, users from the clients and uh, uh, and then do the standard word clause. But what happens if the client has 10,000 users? So we would essentially be saying, all right, load up all 10,000 users, join against the users' widgets, which that's many, many, which we could have 50,000 records at that point, filter through um, all the distinct widget IDs and return that. That is hella, hella, hella slow because of that. However, what if we denormalize and shove client ID on user widgets? User has a client, therefore the user widget has a client as well. Uh, we could use a for save hook or some other trigger to populate it if we want. So now we have a direct relationship from clients to user widgets. I don't know about you, but that's a little, kind of a nicer query to run. We're doing one jump to one. What, well, we're essentially just looking at one table at that point. We're not doing any other jumps, and that is much quicker. So this is kind of a contrived example of denormalizing. Um, if you have a series of tables that are related to each other, um, and querying one table commonly need, needs data from another table, and they are relations to other tables, it may be worth it to just start duplicating those columns across multiple tables. Um, like I said, you can use <coughs> after the four save folks or just in your bulk import or whatever, start shoving the same data in there, index them, and that way you can target one table at a time. The less joining you do, or and also the less sub you do, the faster the overall query can run because Postgres is just focusing on one table at that point. All right, so that's pretty much all my tips. We want to close with a feature that very few people use, the with clause, which is exclusive-ish to Postgres, I think. I don't think others use it. Um, it basically allows you to build a temporary table, name it, and then reference it in a main table. Um, I have two examples, because it's kind of hard to visualize why you would want this. Um, we primarily primarily use it in Mobi for um, app, um, percentages. Um, so we're a call center, so we want a percentage of first call resolved, for example. Here's an example of uh, we want a, we have a bunch of users, and users can file complaints. We want the percentage of users who are unhappy, because they, it's unha they are unhappy if they have three, uh, more than three complaints. So what we do is we say, we want a temporary table for this query called unhappy users. We're going to run that as a count of calling a user, that should be as user count, sorry from the complaints table, group them by user ID, having a count greater than three. So we essentially have, you can visualize a temporary table of, of uh, uh, user ID and count total number of complaints. We can then reference that in our main query, select, we're going to do map here. We're going to round to the nearest decimal one single decimal, I think. We're going to take the user count of unhappy users, divide that by the total count of all users, times 100 because we're doing a division, and so we'll have a decimal result, and we get percentage. We select all of that from the unhappy users table. 
Um, you can also tack on as many with clauses as you want. So you could have one with clause building a set of, uh, let's say, total sales for all regions, and then referencing in another with clause um, that same, the, the previous with clause, but with sales greater than 1,000 grouped by something else. And then you can use that in another subtable, in, in a uh, main select um, query, and join against other tables using the with clause as another data source as well. Um, here's a bit more complex example. So in the previous, we're adding client ID to user widgets. Let's just say this is after the fact. We realize this was a horrible, horrible idea, so we added client ID. We need to backfill that, don't we? Yes, we do. We can use with clauses to do that. Going to make a temporary table called user client relation. I'm going to select the client ID, the user ID, we're going to essentially do a join between users and user widgets, joining on the user. So now we have a temporary table of client ID matching up with a user ID. We're now going to say, we want to update all the user widgets. We're going to set the client ID equal to the um, user's client ID from the with clause. We're going to select from the with clause where the user ID in the with clause matches up with the user widgets user ID. Can anyone visualize that at all? It works, yeah. trust yeah. me. Okay. So we're, yeah. So we're essentially building the translation table in memory, saying <coughs> this user, if you find a user in uh, the user ID and user widgets of two, we need to put the client ID of eight in there. So it's taking that and just basically zipping it all up. Uh, a question about that. Uh, is this functionally different from doing that subquery? I guess you have subquery. Uh, in the from class? Um, n not really. Um, it just allows you to separate it out. Okay. And, like, and, and like I said, you can throw in a comma before that update clause and throw in another with clause and re basically reference it up the chain. I don't believe okay. subqueries from the from can reference each other, but with, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Okay. But I know with clauses can reference any with clause before that, before, okay. before it. Okay. Um, I assume that the lifetime is basically just the lifetime of the statement. Yes. How, how, would, how, would you, how is it different than select into into the temp table? Um, and then access you don't have to make the temp table. It just you just do it. No, you, well, you, it's the same thing. You just say select and you your 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 question your query into a temp into a temp, which is the same thing. You're about it in the from class. No, you can you can just do is a, a select. And, and basically have it create a temporary table by saying into temp, and you can also qualify it by saying temporary or temp table. And that would either go into the memory or into an actual database. And that's what I would always used to using, but with one of those new I, 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 th I, think, I think it's mainly possibly for readability's sake. Like I said, this is just a use case of it. You can do bulk deletes with it, or like I said, you can build a series of other temporary tables. Um, like I think it's it makes it just easier to rationale rationale what's happening if you separate it all out like that. Um, and at this point, it was nine o'clock last night, so I just stopped. Um, I do have other uh, other tips for you. Um, integers are much faster to search, especially if they're indexed in uh, strings. So uh, if you want to sort on relate, if you want to sort on a relation on something. Try to use the foreign key instead of a string. Uh, so like a status. So you have a statuses table, and then your widgets have the status ID. It's much faster to figure out what status ID you want and filter on that on the main table. Um, always specify an order by. So fun fact, if your table is 10,000 rows and you're paginating through all of them to build something, you don't specify an order by, um, Postgres will grab whatever row it wants. You, um, unless you specify an order by this in the, in the docs, you're never guaranteed what rows you get back. Postgres will eventually just start grabbing, well, it'll build the results set and then start cutting, paginating through, but it'll eventually get to the point where it's just grabbing records off whatever physical location on the hard drive it happens to be. So you can go to, so the jump from like page 20 to 21, you might actually get a same row in page 21 than you got in page 20. 
Uh, the way around that is you have to force Postgres to explicitly sort by something. Um, this is different from MySQL, which in, in implicitly sorts by a primary key if it's there. Um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, whenever you change a and whenever you add a column, remove a column, rename a column, change a column type, you have to use an alter table for that. Alter table will always require a full table lock until it's done, regardless of what you're doing. Even if you're adding a column with a null default, it'll still lock the table. It'll be quick compared to having to backfill all the records, but it will still lock the table. Keep that in mind for extremely uh, large tables or very high traffic tables throughout the day. Um, and finally, this almost yields its own talk, window functions. Um, they are in 9.4, I think 9.3 as well, hugely improved in 9.6. Um, they are a way to generate reporting S data in various groups. The primary example is you have sales in broken down by country, region, and uh, city, let's call it that. You can have Postgres run one query and say, give me the total sales for just the US in one row. And you will have region and city blank. Then in the next row, you have US for one region, no city, and then the sum of that record. And then basically every permutation of the three combination of those columns, including the second and third column being the only uh, pieces of data in that row in one table, in one go. Um, it's a, not the most intuitive syntax to do it, but it's there. Um, and there's a very, very, very big documentation page on it, actually pages on it, because there's multiple window functions you can do to manipulate the uh, result set, besides just that example. Uh, did you ask something you want to ask? Oh. I do have a question about the, the alter table thing. Yeah. Do you have any strategies for, say I wanted to add a column with a default value to a large table, any strategies for doing that? Add well? the column with the null value, yeah. then say going forward I want this default, and then backfill. How do you do the going forward? Uh, you, just set, you just set the default. If you, there's, there's a way, if you're doing it in Active Record, there's a way to say, Add column with the default. If you say if you say not null, if you don't say not null true or null false rather, you just set a default. Mm -hmm. I believe the query will just say, all right, matting the column nulls for days going forward. This is going to be the default value. So so Active Record pulls up the default. Uh, if you say null false default whatever, Active Record will run two query well three queries, one to add the column one to backfill the column, and then one to say the column can't be null, I think. Although Postgres may have a way to do it in two queries instead of three. But um, yeah, basically backfill, and then say this column can no longer be null. So uh, that's pretty much it for me. Um, I have a GitHub repo, t 27 dot slash show intel, where I put all my talks. If you wanted a copy of it, of this talk, since I have some links in it for you. So. But it, yep. Does Postgres have like online DL? Big barn? Does Postgres have like you know you know the use storage engine? Uh, di they different like different DLL. engines, just different storage engines in general, or no? So so InnoDB has like an online DL mm. that allows like also online migrations. You talk about like table transaction. Uh, Does Postgres have something? I don't think so. Okay. Or at least I haven't dug into that. Okay. Yes. I have a quick question about speed. Um, so I noticed there's there were some numbers or calculations mm -hmm. there on that one slide where I guess um, using SQL or Postgres, you ran calculations at the database level. Mm -hmm. um, and I've heard that's quicker than, let's say, instantiating a Ruby object, or even yeah. saving something to the database oh, yeah. in Ruby. You just, you just say instantiating a Ruby object, and it's immediately faster. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So well, well, well it's that and, guess, and the round trip back that it has to give as well. Then you initialize the Ruby objects. Then you do your math. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, if you're already like transitioning to Ruby and you're going like from Ruby to database back to Ruby and all that, um, do you run into any problems when maybe the database 
overrides what the Ruby is doing? Or is is it is it tricky to let's say keep everything straight when you're calculating at the database level and also at the uh, Ruby or controller level? I would pick one or the other and stick with it. I wouldn't do both. Right. No. Just for that reason. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yes. Um, we just started using materialized views. Yes. And um, it's pretty cool. And Which Postgres version? 9.4. Okay, they're so better. You can, you can refresh them. Okay, concurrent. that was that is with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can do concurrent refresh, um, but it does require a unique index on it. Um, do the same kind of rules for indexes um, for tables apply to materialized views? They should because Postgres treats it as a regular physical table at that okay. point. Okay, so I should go back and add some. Yeah, that, that's the whole benefit of materialized view is that you don't have to rely on the indexes of the tape of the tables that it derives from. Yeah, but, but then you have to you have to trade off. It has to refresh it, obviously. But yeah, but the fact that you can do it concurrently helps. Yes. So just to be clear, a materialized view is a physical t physical table, right? Yes. It's, yeah. it's basically like copy that data over to a new table. Yes. And if you, if you have a particularly ugly query that takes a long time to yeah. run at runtime, populate a materialized view, and then it's just query that. It's going to decide how often to refresh it. Yeah, and you can do that. Um, there's, a, there's a gem called Scenic that lets you um, handle refresh inside your um, Ruby models. So um, it, you basically create a model for your view, and you just call it the refresh, and it'll do it. So it's just pretty sweet. Um, Wanted to throw out. Um, there's a there's a really cool Rails engine called PG Hero. I heard of that. Um, which we use um, that lets you inside your app see a lot of the stats that you normally would do at the console. Um, but do make sure that you put it behind authentication and authorization <laughs> because bad things might happen. Yes. Can you mount it like as just a separate app as well? Um, I. I think you can do it standalone, but okay. we've got it integrated into our app as, okay. as just an engine of the route. Okay. Um, but it's behind, um, behind. The screenshots look pretty. I just never got around yeah. to using it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay. You do have to, for um, for some of it, you have to enable the PG stat statements extension, which requires a little bit of non standard configuration in the configuration file, but it's, it's, not, it's not terrible. Okay. Someone in the corner had one more? Yeah, so I've, I've had several people come in and say Postgres no SQL removes the need for Mongo. I am anti Mongo and by principle, so yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm the same, I'm the same way. Right? Okay, yeah. Uh, the, the fact that you have JSON B that's queryable and ag and you can run aggregates on it, which Mongo can't do. And uh, there's a article I forget where it is, but they announced uh, Mongo announced a business intelligence layer to allow Mongo to hook into business intelligence systems. It is a Mongo to Postgres adapter under the scenes. <laughs> and it's not even a good one. Alex, are all of your parlor tricks Postgres specific? Yes. Yes, slash copy, slash timing, slash E, that's all Postgres. Yeah. And, on the actual, and you do it on the actual client in the terminal. Although I think you can, depending on what it is, you can execute, you can act a record base dot connection dot execute them if you really want. But eh, it's more fun to do it on the, do it right there. We good? All right. Thank you.